Em nome do Centro Ruth Cardoso, gostaria de agradecer a presença de todos aqui hoje. Autoridades, parceiros, amigos e familiares de Ruth, sejam todos muito bem-vindos. Quero mencionar também a, a, a ausência da professora Gilda Gouveia, que infelizmente não pôde comparecer porque está com problema de saúde no hospital. O Centro Ruth Cardoso foi fundado em 2010 para preservar a memória e a obra acadêmica e social de sua titular. Hoje, o Centro Ruth Cardoso se transformou em lugar de conexão e encontro, pautado, pautando suas ações e programações na articulação e disseminação de movimentos, conhecimento, propósitos e causas relacionadas à prática de Ruth. Além das instalações do Centro Ruth Cardoso, este edifício congrega outras organizações criadas pela antropóloga, como a Alfa Sol, que tem Manuel Sintra como presidente, a Comunitas, a Unisol e a Arte Sol. Todas essas organizações estão ligadas aos temas de atuação de RUT, seja no apoio à formação de jovens e adultos, na preparação desses jovens para o mercado de trabalho, ou na própria gestão pública, com a formação de lideranças e inovações para o setor, sempre em torno de causas que unem a sociedade para uma agenda comum. O evento hoje é realizado em parceria com o Fronteiras do, do Pensamento. E temos a honra de trazer a doutora Deirdre McCloskey, que nos brindará com a palestra Economia, Indivíduos, Liberdades e Direitos. Esse nome é muito difícil. Can I call you Didi? <risos> Di. Di é uma Distinguished Professor da Universidade de Illinois, em Chicago, nas áreas de Economia, História, Língua Inglesa e Comunicação, e professora adjunta da mesma universidade nas áreas de Filosofia e Clássicos, onde deu aula de 2000 a 2015. Antes disso, foi professora da Universidade de Chicago durante 12 anos. Escreveu mais de 17 livros e incontáveis artigos sobre temas que variam de economia, teoria e estatística, advocacia de pessoas transgêneras e ética das virtudes burguesas. Ela é conhecida como economista ao estilo da Escola de Chicago, por ter dado aula lá de 1968 a 1980. Porém, McCloskey contesta e se define, vou abrir aspas, uma literata, quantitativista, pós-moderna, a favor da liberdade de mercado, Price, progressista episcopal, mulher do meio oeste americano de Boston, que foi outrora um homem não conservadora, uma cristã libertária, fecha aspas. Isso está na página de McCloskey. Sua última obra é o terceiro longo tomo da trilogia sobre a era da burguesia e o capitalismo, e chama-se Bourgeois Equality, How Ideas Not Capital or Individuals or Institutions Enriches the World. O penúltimo intitula-se Bourgeois Dignity e o último, quer dizer, o primeiro, The Bourgeois Virtues. O livro Bourgeois Equality é extremamente literário e eu comprei o livro, viu? E mesmo para uma leiga em economia, foi um sopro de ar fresco. Desde de McCluskey argumenta que nos últimos dois séculos o mundo experimentou uma queda drástica da pobreza, 
e um aumento absurdo da qualidade de vida de bilhões de pessoas. E nos fornece material estatístico demonstrando isso. Certo? Eu entendi. Segundo entendi desse livro, da trilogia da qual falei, não é a ênfase na desigualdade que importa, mas um novo olhar sobre a pobreza. Qual o problema de nossa pequena elite milionária andar de iate, comer caviar e viajar em seus jatinhos particulares? Dane-se, diz ela. A ênfase na desigualdade só produzirá inveja. E isso conhecemos bem no Brasil, porque temos e vivemos na feitiçaria. O que deve nos preocupar é a busca de soluções para dar aos pobres os meios de obter oportunidades, educação e liberdade para criarem, ousarem e para viverem melhor. E como fazer essa mágica? McCloskey, assim como a antropóloga Ruth Cardoso, que, é, que nos recebe aqui, aposta no incentivo ao empreendedorismo e na capacidade dos, dos indivíduos de criarem seus próprios caminhos e inovarem. Para tudo isso, é claro, precisamos de um mercado e de, livre e de liberdade de um modo geral. É interessante frisar que tanto Ruth Cardoso quanto Di são esperançosas e não têm o visto como a maioria dos economistas e cientistas sociais de olhar mais para os famosos dados e menos para as pessoas reais. E a nossa conferencista é, além de tudo isso que contei, uma literata que escreveu o belo, emocionante e doloroso livro Crossing, a Memoir, no qual narra a sua transição do PHD de Harvard Donald para a economista Deirdre McCloskey. Certamente teremos uma belíssima conferência que acredito produzirá um debate frutífero, porque este centro, dedicado à memória de nossa amiga e grande antropóloga Ruth Cardoso, aposta justamente em ações voltadas para as inovações, as ideias, a juventude e o empreendedorismo. Nossa conversa de hoje terá a mediação do economista, do economista e filósofo Joel Pinheiro da Fonseca. Lembramos também que a palestra está sendo transmitida ao vivo pela página Ruth Cardoso no Facebook. Além disso, contamos com a parceria da editora Ubu. Ubu? De Ubu Rei? Que nos presenteia com a edição brasileira do livro Os Pecados Secretos da Economia. Após a palestra, os presentes poderão adquirir a publicação e participar da sessão de autógrafo na entrada do Centro do Rio de Cardoso. Agradecemos novamente a presença de todos e esperamos que aproveite o encontro. E para darmos o início, chamamos a doutora Lee Macrosa. going to speak for a long time, and I'm not going to try to summarize 1,700 pages of <laughs> argument, but I am going to make one point, which is that the, that the progress of our societies depends, rather obviously, on people, on individuals. And the progressive society, the society in which the poor are becoming rich or much better off, in which, in which people are free to express themselves, themselves in art and science and entrepreneurship and their occupations, is a society of free people 
not governmental. Now, I know that this claim is going to run against what many of you here in the room believe. In a word, you believe in policy. You believe that the way forward for Brazil or the United States is for the government to do things. <laughs> I might point out that your, your, your president, who has 3% approval, and mine, who alas has 30% approval, are both examples of my claim that maybe the government is not the right instrument. If your president and mine can be presidents, <laughs> maybe we not be better not rely on that institution and rely more on the creativity of free, free people. Now, these three books, which I've been working on now for uh, about a quarter of a, uh, of a century, I, I finished the the last of the three, which you kindly mentioned just last year, you notice it's even thicker than the others because I was going to do four books instead of three. But I said to myself, look, a trilogy might be considered somewhat self-indulgent, <laughs> but a tetralogy is an abomination. <laughs> So I squeezed it all into the last volume. And I'm, I'm, the theme of the book, the books, started out as a defense of what we normally call capitalism. I don't like the word capitalism. I think it's kind of foolish. It, it leads us to think that capital accumulation is the heart of the modern world which is false. All societies accumulate uh, capital. From Auschulian hand axes, I'll speak to my anthropological colleagues here, down to the Grand Canal and the Great Wall in China, uh, Roman aqueducts. Everyone accumulates. Everyone exploits. So that can't be the explanation either. That's the explanation from the left, that the Yankees are rich because they exploited the Brazilians, or the Europeans are rich because they exploited the Brazilians. <laughs> and that can't work either, essentially for the same reason that sheer capital accumulation doesn't work. So, to, to, so it, it started as a defense, especially in this first book, an ethical defense of capitalism. I'll, I'll keep using the word because I'm afraid we're, we're, we're stuck with it, as long as you realize that it's inaccurate. In this first book, I argued that being a part of an economy is not corrupting necessarily. I mean, sometimes it is, but so is being a part of a church or being a part of an aristocracy or being a part of, uh, 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 of a government. All those are possibly corrupting. If I thought that capitalism took our immortal soul, I would not be in favor of capitalism. I don't care how many TVs we got or how many trips to France or how much French cheese we got. I don't care. The, the material goods are not the purpose of human life. And if we became vulgar and stupid like Donald Trump as a result of participating in the market, I would be against markets. So in this book, I think I made a plausible case 
that there can be a commercial version of courage, justice, temperance, prudence, faith, hope, and love, which all in fact are called on in a market society. I'm not, not necessarily saying that socialism, say, doesn't call on some of these virtues too. It does. But my point is, contrary to what a lot of us believe when we're 16-year-old socialists, as I was, that it's not inevitable that a capitalist is a bad person. It's not inevitable, and I'm afraid this is a problem in, in Brazil, as it is in Russia. There's an automatic hatred and suspicion of merchants, those who buy low and sell high, and automatic worry that the corporations are simply instruments of monopoly and corruption of the government as indeed they sometimes are. We're fallen creatures, as we say in Christianity. We're sinful creatures. That's always a possibility. I'm just saying it's not inevitable. But then I started to see that this ethical change, which I spotted in the first book, between the Middle Ages and modern times, was perhaps a cause of the modern world, a cause of our enrichment, a cause of our, of our spiritual change. And in the next two books in the series, which, which by the way, you can buy and sit by your, um, your bedside, read, they're all short chapters. We read one chapter a night and in about six months, you'll be very highly educated. <laughs> you'll also be exhausted, but you know, hey, there's no such thing as a free lunch. <laughs> by the, and these, these three, by the way, are available as audio books. I was quite pleased by this. Uh, this company bought the rights from my, my publisher, which is the University of Chicago. And they're available as audio books in English. Um, and <laughs> The company came to me and said, we have this great man who can narrate your books. And I said, no way, Jose. <laughs> no man is going to read my books. Get a woman. I said, oh, oh, oh yeah, oh yeah, okay. <laughs> so they did, and she, she did an excellent job. <laughs> so I, I started to see that ethics, that how we treat other people, how we talk about other people, is a crucial change in the development of the modern world. And to rapidly summarize the basic point of the book, these, all three of them now, innovation. Look around you. Dropped ceilings, electric lights, wood paneling, steel, inexpensive steel, and the educations that all of you have been the the advantage, uh, they had the advantage of microphones, which fail about a third of the time. <laughs> if you're an audio engineer, I want you to stop listening to me and go to your laboratory and fix <laughs> microphones. I'm sick of them breaking all the time. But anyway, the, what makes us rich, what makes us prosperous, is this, this astonishing number of institutional and biological and mechanical innovations organizational innovations, such as containerization, the big boxes that carry stuff between here and China. Um, where does it come from? Is it the result of investment, capital accumulation, exploitation? No. It's the result of liberalism. It's the result of the idea which becomes a commonplace among advanced intellectuals in the world, including Brazil, in the, in the 1700s, and especially in the 1800s, and now is, is conventional even in the worst tyrannies. <laughs> they all claim that they believe in equal human dignity, 
equality of access to markets and to employment, uh, <laughs> equality before the law. North Korea claims this. <laughs> so even the worst examples of governments in the world now accept that a liberal society is an economy is the best. Look, Adam Smith, the blessed Adam, I have <laughs> Adam Smith is a wonderful man, and you should, you, instead of just relying on what my friends on the left say about Adam Smith, read him. He's actually very funny, which you wouldn't expect from an 18th century author. He's very amusing. At least I find it funny. Maybe you wouldn't. <laughs> but he said, what we need is the liberal plan. This is in 1776. The liberal plan of social equality, economic liberty, which means your ability to start a hairdressing salon, which I desperately need, um, anywhere you want, to go into any occupation you want, to be free to move from the Northeast to uh, Sa Sa Sao Paulo to find a job, to start an Uber, enterprise, if you want it, that's economic liberty. And third, legal justice. Equality of social standing, liberty in economic action, and equality before the law. Now those were extremely radical ideas in the 1700s. I mean, in, the, in the, the centuries before, they were regarded, were thought of as completely crazy. No one would say such a thing as that all men are created equal, men and, and women here, are created equal. This, by the way, was written by an owner of slaves, so maybe we've got to, to, to worry about that. But um, no one thought that. There was a priest named... Ball, John Ball, who in the, the, the Peasant Revolt in England in 1380 wrote, when, when Adam delved, which means dug, plowing, and Eve span, which means spinning, spinning, right, spinning, uh, when Adam delved and Eve span, who then was the gentle man? Who was the noble? For which he was drawn and quartered, which is a particularly nasty way of dying. It was not to be tolerated, this idea that people were equal. And that's what liberalism is. You've been, you've been accustomed to hearing it, uh, hear it described as neoliberalism or or, uh, I don't know, the crazy uh, fascists who call themselves liberals in your country, um, um, some of them. That's not real liberalism. Real li li liberals li liberalism treats people with equal dignity. It's not right wing or left wing. Because along that spectrum, which we're so accustomed to since the French, revolution of thinking, that's where it originated, on the right and the left, they're just arguing about how the state will be used violently to oppress people. On the right, we'll use the state to oppress the working class. On the left, we'll use the state to oppress the middle class. Cool. Take your pick. In Venezuela, they've chosen to use the state to oppress the middle class with expected results. So that's my claim this evening. That liberalism is neither left nor right. It's, it's not along this, this line. It's up in another part of the space 
where the use of the violence of the state, I mean, Max Weber, in 1919, correctly defined the state, the government, as the monopoly of legitimate violence in a certain, certain territory. And we, that's good. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm not against states. I'm not against government entirely. But we, we want a monopoly of violence. We don't want many sources of violence. We don't want a bunch of gangs wandering around exercising violence against you and me. So it's good that there's the state. But it's very dangerous. And, and, and my point is that it's not through the state that we became rich. There's a book by, I forget her first name, but her last name is Matsukato. What's her name? Mariana Mazzucato, and it's a silly damn book, I must say. <laughs> she says, she says that, that, she calls it the entrepreneurial state. <laughs> Come on. What? <laughs> look around you. Look, look, look around you. Uh, that the things that make your lives easy or comfortable or pleasurable and ask yourself how many of them were created by the Brazilian state. <laughs> take, 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 please, take Brasilia itself, if you, if you want a big example of what the state creates. I've never been there. I'd like to go just to see how awful it is. <laughs> no, that's silly. I shouldn't insult my, 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 uh, my hosts. So, so you, see, you see the tendency here. It's to let people, as the English say, have a go. And that's to let create human creativity flourish. And that's what happened. When you started to treat, when you freed the slaves, when you freed women, when you freed poor people, when you freed immigrants, when you freed people who weren't of your religion, in England, uh, Catholic emancipation, um, when you freed GLBT people, when you freed uh, people of color, when you freed colonial people, all these freedoms these were against the state, usually. In fact, universally. We had a great civil war to abolish slavery. You were much wiser and didn't have, have a civil war in abolishing slavery, but both of us abolished slavery. And when you free people, it turns out it doesn't have to be this way. It's not a mathematical proposition, but it just turned out historically <coughs> that free people are immensely creative. And out of the mutual create creativity of positive sum exchange comes the riches of the modern world. I mean, I, I'm sorry to keep harping on Donald Trump, but Donald Trump is such an idiot. He thinks that trade is, is zero sum. He thinks that the only way for the United States to get better off is to, is to damage Mexico <laughs> or China. And you know, the art of the deal is to try to hurt the other person. So in short, I'm arguing for a generous, dignified, tolerant society that doesn't reach for the instruments of violence to convince people. I'm arguing, so to speak, this relates to some of my earlier work, for a rhetorical society, a society in which sweet talk <coughs> is dominant. The sweet talk of the marketplace, the sweet talk in a family, persuading people, not taking out the gun and compelling them. So that's my position. I'm a liberal. Yet, I'm a Christian liberal. 
I believe um, that we owe a duty of help to the poor and the disadvantaged. And I'm willing to be taxed to help them out. I'm not willing to be taxed to give subsidies to other middle class people. And that's largely what governments do. Because middle class people vote. So those are my views and welcome to them. <laughs> so shall we talk? Vamos lá. Bom, em primeiro lugar, queria dizer que, para mim, é uma honra estar aqui conversando com a professora Deirdre Makoski, sou um leitor dela, e agora tenho esse privilégio de ter essa conversa, mas essa conversa também é entre todos nós, então sintam-se livres também para mandar perguntas. Mas eu vou começar provocando um dos temas, Deirdre, um dos das causas fundamentais da riqueza no mundo, como você muito bem argumenta e persuade nos seus livros, são ideias inovações que trazem todas essas maravilhas tecnológicas e também nos modos de, de interação e nas instituições humanas. Hoje em dia, continuamos a viver um período de rápida inovação e criação de novas ideias, produzindo novas tecnologias. Muitas dessas tecnologias, embora nos tornem mais ricos enquanto consumidores, pois barateiam o acesso, nosso acesso a tantos produtos e serviços, estão cada vez mais também tornando o ser humano obsoleto do ponto de vista do trabalho. E existem até previsões, ou medos, ou receios de que grande parte do trabalho humano se tornará obsoleto em algumas décadas. Isso é verdade? E se sim, como é que a gente lida com isso? I do not find it true. I have an article in Reason magazine, a liberal magazine in the United States. I think it's in the last month's issue about technological unemployment. And there's all kinds of reasons not to believe that it's true. The normal functioning of an economy like Brazil's or the United States, which, by the way, are capitalists, both of them are. Um, is, now hear this, this is quite interesting. Every year in the United States, and I'm sure it's more or less the same figure in Brazil, maybe somewhat lower, but still very good, 14% of the jobs disappear forever. 14%. And this isn't because of robots or computers. This is, look, <laughs> you, you've had the same experience. In, in the year 2000, over 130,000 Americans were employed in, now hear me, video stores. Video stores. Gone. 130,000 people. And at 14%, if the, if the worries that people have about technological unemployment were true, in a few years we'd have half the population unemployed. In seven years, the entire population would be unemployed. We'd be sitting around doing, doing nothing. But, but there are always jobs. There's always something to do. As you know, as an economist, the character of employment is changing radically. Uh, uh, factory jobs, which are, are fa my, my father worked in a shoe factory before he became a professor at Harvard, I have to admit. Um, th those kinds of jobs are vanishing. And people get really spooked by robots. The robots are coming. <laughs> Scary music. Wee, wee. <laughs> the robots are coming. But think about it. Every tool is a robot. Shovels are robots. Wheels are robots. In uh, Afrikaans, the, the daughter of Dutch of South Africa, the word robot means traffic light. <laughs> Because it substitutes for a man with 
the white gloves uh, on a pillar directing the traffic. So there's, there's no serious problem here. Um, this anxiety, though, has been, has been articulated by many very sophisticated economists. Ricardo, we just celebrated the 200th anniversary of his, his great book. He worried about it. And lots of excellent economists like my friend Bob Gordon have worried about it. They're wrong, and I'm right. <laughs> and as an economic historian, I got the evidence that every time there's a new innovation, there's new jobs. Jobs are endless. Eu queria trazer a discussão agora para um problema tipicamente brasileiro. Dirdre, você argumenta, e de forma muito persuasiva, que a desigualdade é uma questão muito menos importante do que a pobreza. Porque, na verdade, o que a gente busca, acima de tudo, é melhorar a vida dos mais pobres e não necessariamente reduzir a desigualdade. Hoje em dia, no mundo, uma grande literatura trata desse tema da desigualdade. Você, inclusive, fez uma crítica muito contundente ao Piketty, recentemente, que foi quem trouxe esse tema aí para o debate. E aqui no Brasil, além dessa discussão internacional, nós temos o fato de sermos um dos países de maior desigualdade econômica do mundo. E, de alguma maneira, sempre se viu que, ou se acreditou, ou se pensou que a distância entre ricos e pobres aqui era excessiva e que algo precisa ser feito e que, e que de reduzir essa desigualdade seria uma coisa boa. Então eu te pergunto de uma forma até um pouco filosófica. Sem dúvida, a pobreza é uma questão mais relevante do que a desigualdade econômica. Mas a desigualdade econômica também importa? Há bons motivos para a gente se preocupar, talvez um pouco, com a desigualdade econômica? I wrote a long review of Piketty's book, and I didn't read any of the other reviews before I wrote it, because his is a serious project, and he's a serious economic scientist, and I thought it was only fair that I, 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 I give him a reading independent of the opinion of my colleagues in economics and elsewhere. And I, here's the problem. Since 1800, income per head in Brazil has increased by a factor of 30. That's 3,000%. The problems of poverty that you can solve by redistributing from the rich to the poor are much smaller in magnitude than 3,000%. <coughs> I mean, if you took, I don't know, all the income of the people who somewhat obnoxiously, when I first went to, went, went, went to Rio, I was quite shocked that right in the middle of Rio are tennis courts lit up at night so the people in the favelas can look down on the multi-millionaires playing tennis of an evening. And I found this obnoxious. Obnoxious it is, but taking from the tennis players and giving to the residents of the Fevalas, this money is not going to increase their incomes by 3,000%. Or increases their income by 3,000% is letting the economy work. Allowing people to make um, a, after Donald Trump, I don't want to use the word deals anymore, <laughs> but to make, make agreements to buy and sell and to think of new ways of, uh, of doing things. Um, Hernando de, de Soto, a wonderful economist in, in, in Peru, has pointed out that if you simply gave the land on which the dwellers in the Fevalas have their shacks, gave it to them, gave them deeds 
so they actually owned it. They could sell the land to, I don't know, developers of tennis courts and use it to buy a fruit cart, use it to send their child to school, use it to advance in life. Instead, they have ambiguous uh, property rights, these poor people do, and they can't advance. So, I, I don't think equality is the problem in the mind. I know, I know Brazil, an, uh, another country I know and love, um, South Africa, is very unequal. My own country, compared with, I don't know, France, is unequal. But look at China and India, which are also unequal. Look at what's, what liberal economic policies have brought to them in the last 30 or 40 years. Brazil is never going to get a much above 1% per year growth for any sustained period of time unless it stops subsidizing people and regulating them and making it hard to open a, a, a business. These two countries, Brazil, South Africa, which I love, won't do what has been so successful in Hong Kong, Singapore, South Korea, Taiwan, China, Botswana, um, and India. Please. Obrigada. I just learned to say obrigada instead of obrigado. <laughs> this is my great knowledge of Portuguese. Você deixou muito clara a sua posição acerca do Estado Grande. E quanto aos grandes empresas, big business, será que elas apresentam um problema de concentração de muito poder e a gente deve buscar controlá-las ou regulá-las de alguma maneira? Seria o Estado, ou talvez os mercados, quem, quem, quem estaria capacitado a fazer esse papel? should be the market and you, it should be open markets. Look, Uber is, has been outlawed in Germany. Now that's, that's protectionism. That's protecting the conventional taxis. Uber is, can transform urban transportation. Uber and Lyft and all the others you have here. Um, but if you say no, 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 we're going to protect the old people. You're never going to have uh, 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 progress. Here's what I find very strange about my friends on the left. As I said, I was once a Marxist myself. So I, under I, can, I can sympathize with them. When they say, my God, there are shoe companies that are big. Let's solve that. And there are companies, I don't know, making ice cream that are big. Let's solve that by putting them all together in one company called the socialist state. Now does that sound like a sensible way of handling monopoly? <laughs> you solve the monopoly by creating a super monopoly called uh, ownership of the means of production. And it, it seems very strange to me. I argue with my friends all the time which is why I have so few friends. <laughs> uh, but but, but it, it, um, this fear, we have it in the United States too. It's not just the Brazilians. This fear of bigness. Oh, um, Facebook, Google have become big. Do you know how recently they became big? How there's some guy in, or gal in a garage right now thinking up a substitute for Google? It's, it's happened over and over and over again. It's the economic history of the world. And yet people don't believe it. They say, no, we've got we've to go in there and regulate. Now 
this would be great if governments were composed of saints and geniuses. Uh, Saint Francis combined with Einstein. But they're not. They're composed of people like you and me. Some of them are here. And I have, I have cousins who work for the government. I don't think they're evil people, but they're people. <laughs> and they get things wrong all the time. It's much better to have a flexible system where if uh, video stores are no longer the right way to distribute entertainment, you do something else. And that comes from the market, not from antitrust. Existe uma importante tese sociológica sobre o Brasil, do Sérgio Buarque de Holanda, que diz, em linhas muito gerais, que o brasileiro ele é, ele é um pouco avesso ao progresso do capitalismo e da democracia, porque ele, ele se move pelo valor do personalismo, de ajudar a sua família e aos seus amigos, acima de tudo, é muito passional, e que isso seria um grande entrave ao progresso econômico nos moldes capitalistas, yeah. de igualdade da lei e de de justiça imparcial. Como você vê isso? Essa questão dos valores é um problema para o Brasil? Ser mais passional, ser um pouco mais... Uh, tender a favorecer mais a, a quem você gosta, ao invés de uma perfeita concorrência no mercado. São problemas para um país que queira enriquecer? Não. Eu não acho que é um problema. Porque isso foi dito sobre a Índia and China. So it was said quite properly about Holland in the 1600s and Britain in the 1700s. They too were societies in which your cousin was the person that you cared about and you found a job for him and it was there was great social social pressure to do that and anyway people wanted to do it. Yet these countries had innovation and economic growth. It worked out and they became free countries as well, free people and rich people. So I, 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 work, I was told when I was a kid, when I was a young uh, student, you know, we were told, oh, you know, India, India will never develop uh, because it, uh, they're all, you know, they're all Hindus. What do you expect from Hindus? And China, oh, China, it's hopeless, hopeless. Families matter too much. And you know, they're all Confucians, or communists, or whatever they were. And yet both of these countries have exploded in economic growth. India's growth rate is four and a half times that of Brazil's. And there's no reason for that. There's no racial inferiority of Brazilians. There's no cultural inferiority. That's, if you let Brazilians have a go, they'll take it up with vigor. Um país como a China é um país que poupa muito. Um país como a China é um país que poupa muito, investe muito, tem muito formação de capital. Você argumentou aqui que não é um dos fatores principais. O Brasil, por outro lado, tem pouco. Tem um nível de investimento baixo e muitos economistas brasileiros apontam isso como um grande entrave ao crescimento brasileiro. Será que ter um investimento baixo demais é um problema? Ou também isso é muito secundário com relação à, à liberdade de mercado? É it's, exatamente it's secundário. Exactly Here's what I mean. Um, when there's a good project, when there's really an opportunity to buy low and sell high, and make a ton of money in, I don't know, Facebook or, 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 I don't know, some steel company, then it's pretty easy to find people to invest in it. The company itself retains its earnings. IKEA, the great Swedish furniture firm, was built with no common stock offerings and no borrowing. It was built on retained earnings and advances from suppliers, that's all. The English cotton textile industry in the 1700s and 1800s 
was not built on massive investment, as later on you had to for things like, like railways. It was built, again, on, mainly on retained earnings. So when there's a good prospect, then people invest. Wouldn't you? If there's a $100 bill on the floor, wouldn't you pay? Actually, I, I say often, economics is superior to physics. If I put a $100 bill on the floor and walk out, what does physics predict about the future location of a $100 bill? It gets it wrong. So when there are opportunities, people uh, take them. And I would expect, although I'm no expert on Brazil, as I know I only know th three words in, in Portuguese, um, uh, nonetheless, I would expect that the problem is that you've clotted up your economy with regulations, with worries about inequality, oh, you've got to be fair, uh, let's, let's, <laughs> let's have a minimum wage that's too high, let's make it impossible to fire people who are incompetent, <laughs> let's, let's clot up the economy so that no project is worth doing. And by the way, the high savings rate in China, which is shocking, 50%, 40% of national income. That's not because they have all these investment projects. It's because they're terrified by their government. They have no pensions. They have no public health. They have none of the things that we expect in the West. And so people are saying, look, we've gotten better off in the last few years. Let's save it, let's save it, because we've got to prepare for our old age there. The government's not going to help us. So I, I don't, I'm not impressed by the, uh, by, by the city. In fact, I was in China for the first time last year, which makes me an expert on China. Uh, I was there for three weeks. And they've invested this immense amount in high-speed rail. So you can whip along at 300 or 350 kilometers an hour between all the major cities in China, even in the, in the West where it's very poor. And it's quite remarkable, but it's not necessarily a good idea. Spain did the same thing when it could get interest rates, German interest rates. And so they built high-speed rail all, all over the place. They've been on them. They're very nice for the rich, like, well, not the well-to-do like me. But uh, they're not obviously a good thing for the government to do. A gente tem falado bastante aqui das coisas que o Estado, o governo, não deveria fazer, né? e que faz mal e que atrapalha a sociedade. Você mencionou uma coisa, pelo menos o monopólio da violência, que seria uma atribuição legítima do Estado. Que outras atribuições, no seu mundo ideal, você, no seu mundo ideal, que outras atribuições você deixaria nas mãos do Estado, se é que você pensa nesses termos? As I get older, I get increasingly radical about this. I mean, look, here's a calculation I did. There are about 180 governments in the world, local monopolies of violence. And they're ranked by their competence and their honesty in surveys. You know, they're very, maybe there are imperfections in this measure, but it's, it's not so bad. Because sure enough, Zimbabwe and North Korea are at the bottom, and New Zealand and Denmark are at the top. Let's take the top 30 countries. I ought to have looked into this this afternoon, but I didn't. I'm not sure where Brazil comes. I think it's below the 30. Let's take the top 30. Spain is the margin. Spain is the marginal case. And above... Spain are the United States and Britain, France, Japan, Korea, etc. They're, 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 uh, they're above. That leaves many governments below 30. And it's a rather low standard. If Spain is a good example of a competent and honest government, what are all these high-speed rails? To, in particular, the high-speed rail that went from Madrid 
to the hometown of the Prime Minister. A little town on the, I think it's on the Mediterranean coast. You know, what's going on there? But okay. And I come from Chicago. You know, which is very, very corrupt. But still, the United States as a whole. Ask yourself, what percentage of the world's population is governed by these 30 pretty good governments? 13%. 87% of the world's population is governed by states, governments, that everyone agrees are, are kleptocracies. Italy is an appalling example. I mean, I love Italy. Who doesn't love Italy? Um, it's 75th in this ranking, down with Vietnam and Kazakhstan. Italy. It's very disturbing. It's very sad. And it suggests that maybe the governmental institution isn't the one we want to work on. Maybe it's better to work on the individual initiative of people and let them have a go and leave them alone. Give them property rights, as in the uh, Avelas, and let them go to town. And what happens is you get 3,000% growth over two centuries, or the remarkable increases in income per head in China or India. Virgil, um dos prazeres de conversar com você é que você traz realmente muitas fontes de conhecimento, né? literatura, teologia, ética, está tudo junto aqui numa explicação do mundo, uma narrativa histórica. Isso é muito diferente do que grande parte dos economistas fazem, inclusive aqui no Brasil. Na verdade, aqui no Brasil, o economista, que é uma figura central, porque o governo está sempre com problemas econômicos, mas o economista é sempre aquele que traz números, dados e uma péssima notícia em geral, tudo que o Brasil precisa fazer economicamente são aquelas propostas que nenhum político jamais teria coragem de defender porque parecem tão malvadas, tão austeras, tão tecnocráticas, sabe? Pensando só em números e não em pessoas. Isso é um problema dos economistas yeah. de hoje em dia? Dava para ser diferente? Ou realmente a gente vai ter que conviver com esse fato de que para as massas jamais a mensagem econômica vai fazer muito sentido? Well, it's, it's, um, it's always a danger in a cocktail party with strangers to announce that you're an economist. <laughs> it usually, it's, it's, it's a bit like saying you're an accountant. It stops the conversation pretty much cold. <laughs> oh, you're an economist. Well, how about the local football team? <laughs> um, and and you're, you're absolutely right. There's a kind of narrowness to economists, which in some ways is good because if you If you actually know what you're talking about in the economy, that's you would you would want that in, in, in a, an economist advising the advi, advising the government. But um, I take the view that we should look at all the scientific evidence, not just the narrow kind of evidence that economists, most economists, think is is to the point. I'm, for a person of my generation, my PhD generation, I'm well trained in econometrics. I mean, which makes me an econometric idiot by modern standards. But still, and I had courses at Harvard, Harvard uh, Graduate School. I had more courses than most other people in econometrics. And I've, le I've learned the math. Paul Sanderson, a great mathematical economist, was my mother's mixed doubles tennis partner for many years and that influenced my mind indirectly. <laughs> so I'm, I'm an economist. I've, I've written books where, you know, you wouldn't know that I ever had, had, had read a novel or a poem. Um, I have an Argentinian-Brazilian friend named Ramon Fernandez who's an economist. And uh, his name, it's not him, but that name occurs in one of the great poems in the English language, the idea of order at Key West. And I was just reading it this afternoon. I love that poem and thought about Ramon. Fortunately, he's not here. He's in France on a sabbatical. So
So it turns out that if you use all the evidence, the poems, even the music, the culture, you can think about economics in a way that we call humanomics. Humanomics. And economics that's not just about this sociopath um, that is, we call him Max U of Deutsch, maximize utility subject to constraints. And he's this, all he thinks about is his own utility. Uh, he, he, he loves his wife because it gives him utility. Something she doesn't appreciate very much when, he's, when he says it. So I, I, I think we'll, you know, express it this way. We, if we hop along on our one leg, our quantitative leg or our positive economics leg, which is a phony leg anyway, um, and, and that's all we do. We're all economists. We sneer at the sociologists and the historians and the literature professors. They're all stupid. And we don't know any philosophy. In fact, in, with economists, if you say, that's rather philosophical, don't you think? That's meant as an insult. <laughs> if you know anything about philosophy, it's a bad thing in economics. We, we, instead of walking on one leg, let's walk on two. We'll make more progress. Para fechar, acho que uma última pergunta. Você tratou um pouco aqui da, da, dos desafios e das propostas de liberdade para todas as áreas da vida humana, não só para questões econômicas de empreendedorismo, mas também para os valores, uh, acolhimento de pessoas diferentes, todas as raças, todas as sexualidades, todos os gêneros. Aqui no Brasil a gente vive uma cisão muito grande disso. Não só aqui, acho que nos Estados Unidos é um pouco assim também. Em que quem def... muitas das pessoas que defendem a liberdade econômica são bastante conservadoras em todos os outros campos. E, pelo contrário, os mais progressistas no campo do gênero, da sexualidade, do, do combate ao racismo, o que é que seja, tende a ter uma visão muito mais estatista, muito mais pró-Estado e pró-governo na economia, na livre iniciativa, no empreendedorismo. E a gente se vê um pouco fadado a ter que escolher entre esses dois campos. Qual que é o melhor aqui? Well, the, the, we have the same problem in the United States, and I, I, I understand the problem. And the, the, the way I explain liberalism to Americans who don't know what the word means. They think that it means left-wing Democrats. I say, no, no. Take the social policy of the Democrats and combine it with the economic policy of the Republicans. And it actually turns out that neither of them are principled. So the Democrats in the 1990s supported in the United States a really terrible increase in, in, in punishment for drug crimes, especially for crack cocaine, which was consumed by black people. Well, let's grab them, throw them in jail, and throw away the key. That's a good idea. Democrats voted for it. On the other hand, fiscal responsibility in the Republican Party Ask what they're going to do right now about the tax, so-called tax reform. Ask what that's going to do to the uh, national debt of the government, the, 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 how much the government owes. So I, I don't regard them as very serious, but anyway, that's the sort of quick way of explaining it. And I'm certainly in favor of, of uh, uh, personal freedoms. And, and I, I think it's a big mistake for people to think that there's a distinction between economic liberty and personal liberty. Freedom is freedom. Being allowed to do what you want to do as long as it doesn't hurt other people is essentially the golden rule. It's not the old golden rule. We used to make jokes about it in Chicago. We hated it. The golden rule. Those who have the gold rule <laughs> this is not the golden rule. Uh, allowing people to flourish by themselves. One more point. 
Would you want the government to run the art world of Brazil? There was just a challenge to a um, exhibition in Porto Alegre and LBGT friendly exhibition was closed down. Um, would you want the government to be in charge of, of literature or historical writing as it is in Cuba, for example? I take it none of us here would want that. Why not apply that to the economy? Why not let people have the same freedom? Why not have ordinary people who want to open a hairdressing salon? Why not give them the same freedom that we fiercely defend um, when Solomon, Solomon uh, Rushdie is threatened with a, a fatwa? We want to protect him and we don't want the government to uh, 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 abuse him? Well. Why not, if we're going to have a f free science, free art, free, free music, free culture in general, why not extend it to the economy, dears? Obrigada. é isso, foi um, falo em nome de todos ao dizer que foi um prazer estar aqui para discutir e conversar com você e é isso aí